Hello and welcome to uh, this class of ATMO 620. This will be the last class of the semester. Um, well, I hope you enjoyed the class. I certainly enjoyed uh, recording the lectures and talking about these topics with you guys. Um, it's really unfortunate that we had to do it in this format. Um, but unfortunately, given the current circumstances, this is probably the only the only way that you know we could uh, that I can teach this class safely. Um, okay, so I want to conclude today's um, with today's lecture. I want to conclude the part on radiation, and I would like to talk about uh, radiative feedbacks. Uh, these are very important. This is a very important topic for um, you know sort of to understand the climate, if you will. Um, and we can start thinking about. Um, the uh, atmosphere or the climate is uh, something very, very simple, okay? And we can start with what is known as an energy balance model. Often in, often in our class, we had to resort to simple models that had, you know, a surface and an atmosphere and or a surface and a continuous atmosphere and whatnot. Um, this is an even simpler model. And it doesn't have any kind of spatial dimension. It only has a time dimension. So, I mean, it is a one-dimensional model in the sense that it has time, but spatially, uh, it only contains energy. So, suppose that you have a, a box, essentially, right? And uh, you are letting things come in the box, things come out of the box, and your balance is just to say that what is coming out equals what is going in plus whatever happens inside, <laughs> if you will. Just kind of um, how uh, these simple box models work. And this is known as an energy balance model because it is what it does. I mean, it is what it says it is. It, it's a model that balances the energy within, uh, within the system. And um, this is often used, for example, I don't know, if you're dealing with computing the temperature of the top 100, uh, 100 meters of the ocean, right? Or you assume that the troposphere is just one big block of things um, and so forth. So we will neglect um, heat transport uh, in the ocean for this climate model, and we will only consider short wave and long wave radiation causes some heating, okay? And with this, the model is simply described by, uh, by this formula here. On the right-hand side, we have the net radiative forcing, the net irradiance um, for the box, okay? And on the left-hand side, we have uh, temperature, sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing the pointer. Um, a temperature, the changes in temperature um, multiplied by uh, the heat capacity. Right, which kind of makes sense and it's what you would expect, right? If there's more energy coming in than it's going out, you'd expect temperature here to go up with some proportionality constant that is the um, that is your heat um, that is the heat capacity. Okay. Uh, in this simple model, uh, F with the arrow pointing down is the non-reflected solar irradiance, so what is coming in and, you know, after albedo has been taken into account and whatnot. And uh, F upward is the uh, out outgoing long wave radiation at the top of the atmosphere, okay? Uh, obviously, <clears throat> it's a good question to ask when I, you know, here when we say heat capacity, heat capacity of what? Right, because the climate is so complicated. Uh, we could take, for example, the heat capacity uh, of, um, you know, some mixed layer, oceanic mixed layer uh, near the surface and, and use that um, as the heat capacity. Uh, okay, very good. Um, obviously, the F down, as we said in the last lecture, F down is related to F zero, the uh, solar constant. And, uh, well, sorry, F down is what we call F0, which is related to, drew the wrong arrow, which is related to Fs, which is the solar constant. 
uh, solar constant is about uh, 1370 watts per meter squared. Um, this, if you account for 30% uh, uh, albedo, and you also account for geometric effects, you know, the fact that you're kind of substituting a spherical Earth with, uh, you know, a, a, a flat Earth, okay, then you have to take into account this factor of four, <clears throat> and this gives us uh, an effective um, solar constant of 240 watts per meter square, okay? Um, now, the um, notice that the... Um, F down is just one some some constant. It doesn't depend on anything. It doesn't depend on what happens in the atmosphere. It doesn't depend on uh, the temperature, the greenhouse gas mixing ratio, or and whatnot. But F up in general, uh, meaning the outweigh outgoing long wave radiation OLR. I'm just going to call it OLR because outgoing long wave radiation is hard to uh, to remember. Uh, anyway, so OLR uh, does depend on, on these things. And so. Um, the uh, the net irradiance, uh, which is also telling you the net flux of heat into the climate system, is going to be some kind of function, and this function will generally depend on the temperature and on a bunch of other variables. You uh, you will assume for the moment our greenhouse gas uh, concentrations. Okay, just simply. If we were at equilibrium, if the climate system was at equilibrium, then uh, this would be zero, okay? And we can call TSS and USS temperature and those concentrations that uh, characterize the equilibrium state. Obviously, we're thinking about climate here, so we're not thinking about daily changes or seasonal changes. So imagine we're averaging over 30 years, okay? And so at equilibrium, this would be zero, which is fantastic. Now, remember a while ago we were talking about Newtonian cooling and we introduced the concept of perturbing the equilibrium state. So what happens now if you perturb the equilibrium state, you know, if you nudge the system a little bit? Uh, well, you could say, you know, let's assume that there is some variation of temperature, we'll just call this T prime, some, var some variation of the greenhouse gas concentration U prime, okay? Now, the new equation, let me get rid of these arrows uh, that are ugly. The new equation now will be something like, there, there will be some temperature tendency because the system will respond to your change, to your nudge, okay? And this will be equal to um, the new value of the net heating, okay? And this will be a function of the new temperature and the new water and the new greenhouse gas concentrations. Now, remember what we said that if you perturb the system even just by a little bit, then you can expand, you can tailor expand the system around the small perturbation, okay? So you can tailor expand it around the small temperature perturbation, you can tailor expand it around this uh, greenhouse gas um, perturbation. And this is exactly what we have here, okay? This is slightly, almost pretty, to, to, to linear order, this is equal to dQ dt, the derivative of this with respect to temperature, times um, the variation in temperature, dQ du, okay, the derivative with respect to uh, u, uh, plus a bunch of other terms that, you know, uh, this will be u prime t prime plus u prime squared, um, what I meant to say, sorry, that will be some function, you know, the der cross derivatives, uh, u prime to prime, uh, you know, u prime squared and whatnot. So there'll be these f, g, call it however you want, but this just to say that there'll be additional terms that depend on higher powers of t prime and u prime, and we ignore these terms, okay? We say t and u prime, t prime and u prime are so small that their variations are, you know, small enough that they're powers are much smaller than, than the linear term, okay? Okay, so dQ dt, this is called climate feedback, feedback parameter, and this is telling you essentially, it's telling you how much heat is going to be pumped into the system when you change the temperature a little bit, okay? So you perturb this a little bit and you'll change, you know, the net heating in the system and this will create 
some temperature tendency, okay? Uh, and this is what we call a radiative force thing, okay? This term here defines radiative force thing. And so if you rewrite this, um, you know, this we call minus F, and uh, this we call minus alpha. It's clear that you can rearrange things and you could define, you can rewrite the equation like this. So far, we're just redefining things, okay? So this is not a particularly enlightening thing. F in general would be some complicated function of stuff, which ultimately depends on time. Uh, we don't know what F is. And, uh, you know, this is just a simple, uh, simple term. Uh, now, does this equation remind you of anything? And I hope the answer is yes. Um, this should remind you the Bayer law equation because it has exactly the same structure. Um, the Bayer law with the Schwarzschild additional term. And so in principle, this equation can be solved uh, no problem, right? If we multiply, uh, I think we want to divide first everything by C and we um, multiply everything by, um, what am I saying? Uh, we are, I think we, sorry, I think we want to, to the opposite, uh, divide everything by alpha. Right, and so this is simplified and multiply everything by E to the C over alpha um, T and this can then be solved. I think that is what we should do. Let me just double check um, Okay, PowerPoint is going crazy uh, Well, anyway uh, Yes, uh, long story short. Yes um, If you do that, then you can rewrite a generic solution for uh, for T prime, you know, uh, this will be equal to uh, FT with some exponential and blah 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 blah. But you can apply essentially the same machinery if you apply if you multiply everything by um, uh, by that exponential term. Okay, so we have a function. Okay, and this function, well, we have a differential equation. And this differential equation depends, among other things, on two important parameters. Uh, the first one is alpha, which uh, I remind you, alpha was defined as minus dq dt, right? And the other was c, the uh, the heat capacity. Now, how do we estimate these things? Uh, okay, so if the planet was, why do I always mess things up when I try to fix them? Anyway, that was a minus sign. Uh, anyway, so um, um, if the planet was uh, a small thing that you had on the lab, you could just increase the temperature. You know, you could just literally just hit it and see where it goes, right? But unfortunately, the planet, it just, it's big and it's just one. And so it's kind of hard to know exactly what this term is, okay? The, um, the climate feedback parameter. I'm again messing up everything. Anyway, um, and this is actually a big problem because these terms are now important to understand what's going on with climate change, but we don't have a direct way to estimate these parameters, okay, in a very simple way. Uh, and same for like the heat capacity, like who knows, right? Um, anyway, um, well, what we could do is that um, we could put things in a model, in a, in a numerical model, that kind of simulates the Earth as well as, you know, as well as it gets, and then play, do the experiments that we would do on a planet, do them with the model, and then estimate um, the, uh, these two parameters. Um, typical estimates are for alpha, for example, they're about one watts per meter square per Kelvin. So if you increase the temperature of one, then this parameter here, um, the um, the the sort of the uh, the left hand side of the other equation, so C D T D T, this would contribute with one watts per meter square, if you will. Okay, it would be the same as adding 
uh, one watts per meter square to the incoming solar radiation, if you will, you know. Um, and C is about a billion joules per kilogram per, pardon me, uh, joules per Kelvin per meter square. Okay. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the other parameter that we had discussed was um, the radiative forcing, and the radi the radiative forcing is really um, what you can, you know, what can mess things up, right? Because um, if the um, radiative forcing would, was zero, okay, let me just clean up this equation. If the radiative forcing was zero, then uh, this would be a very simple model, right? You'd have that uh, dt prime dt equals minus alpha over c t prime. Uh, I mean, you don't need me to, to tell you what's going to happen. That t is going to behave like an exponential, right? Alpha over C um, T, where C over alpha will provide some kind of a time constant, meaning that if for whatever reason, whatever internal reason, temperature changes by a little bit, then on a time scale of the order of C over alpha, then things will go back to normal. But, you know, in this way, the, the system is always, you know, kind of relaxing towards some kind of equilibrium. But this term here can really mess things up because now you're introducing uh, a forcing from outside. And so this can nudge, this can kick the, um, your climate really out of equilibrium, okay? Um, and this climate forcing can depend on really many things. I mean, it can depend on uh, things like, I think I'm forgetting the variable here, uh, parenthesis, sorry. Uh, it can depend on... Um, you know, the concentration of water vapor can depend on clouds, it can depend on albedo, uh, tropospheric lapse rate. And so, you know, this can depend on a lot of things. Um, and all these depend on temperature as well. And so um, I think a better way uh, to, uh, to define uh, the climate feedback is actually uh, to take into account the fact that there are more variables, right, that could uh, mess up uh, with the system. So uh, before we just said, well, um, we had Q was a function of T and U, and U was sort of a given, and so you can compute dQ dt, and that's, you know, clear what that means, dQ du, clear what this means, um, but uh, Q depends on things that depend on temperature, and so actually when you compute this, this hides a lot of uh, other dependencies on temperature, right? And in particular, if you take, um, you know, if you want to really take the, all the derivatives with respect to temperature into account, then you would have dq over dt, but then you would have uh, dq over du1 times du1 over dt, because, um, you know, this species might actually change in concentration with temperature. Uh, you know, I'm thinking water vapor, I'm thinking clouds of clapron. Um, and so this will also have an effect. Uh, plus, you know, dq, du2, du2, dt, and so forth. And so when you define the climate feedback, it's not only, you know, how the heating is going to change with respect to temperature, but also how the heating is going to change with changes um, of other things that depend on temperature. Okay, and so you really need to take into account all these additional terms, okay? Um, and the radiative forcing will be uh, a sum of all these different things, okay? All these different, you know, dq, du uh, times, um, times u prime, okay? Uh, yeah, so u and v and, and whatnot. Um, okay, and so this is interesting because... Um, these two slides are somehow um, duplicates. Uh, okay, so ignore this slide. Uh, but this is interesting because now this means that when you're considering the response of the climate to some kind of nudging, then there are more things that you need to take into account. Okay, and in particular, because the climate is a complicated 
sum of many complicated and different things, you could have um, you could have different things um, that different things conspire to push you one way or another. Okay, so let me be a bit more explicit to you know to, to show what I'm what I'm what I mean by this. Um, suppose that uh, you're just considering the uh, you're just considering Q is the the net heating at equilibrium net heating is zero, and this is simply uh, irradiance coming down minus irradiance going up, which is F zero, okay? This is, you know, quarter one minus a solar constant minus alpha T uh, at equilibrium to the fourth power. Let's just, you know, let's just forget about the atmosphere for a moment. Let's just say, you know, this is what it is. It's the value that it is, that it is okay? Uh, very good. Well, what happens if uh, now I compute, you know, now Q has, if you don't have an atmosphere, Q has a clear, simple dependency on um, on the temperature here, okay? Also, uh, my spidey senses tell me that this is a typo. This should be sigma. My apologies. Um, you know, good old Stefan Boltzmann. Um, Okay, well, what is the climate feedback uh, for this system? Well, the climate feedback we had defined as uh, minus dq over dt. Okay, this is alpha. And this is minus, that cancels with minus, 4 sigma tss to the third power. Okay, and this is about, uh, you know, you can compute this. This is about 3.8 watts per meter square per Kelvin. So... What happens? What, what's going on here? Um, and we and why do we call this a feedback? In this case, we call this the black body feedback. So what 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 does it mean? Well, it means that in this case, if we heat up the system, let's suppose that we increase the temperature of the Earth for whatever reason in whatever way that we want. Okay, the temperature is going to increase. And the increase in temperature is going to cause uh, a greater emission in the long wave, right? Because the emissions are proportional to the power, the fourth power of the temperature. So greater temperature, greater emission. But then greater emission is going to cause a cooling to the system. Okay? And so it's going to bring down the temperature. And so the system is going to go back to its equilibrium that it had before. Okay? So this is an example of what we call a feedback in that we push the system one way, but then there are some other processes that push the system another way. In this case, this climate feedback parameter alpha that we computed, or alpha BP that we computed, was positive, meaning that um, the uh, system is going back towards an equilibrium. So the solution, if you were to uh, derive the equation, it would be something like... Um, I don't know, some kind of a TSS um, minus, times 1 minus e to the minus, was it c over alpha or alpha over c? I'm, I'm forgetting. Let's go back to the equation. So it was alpha over c. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no. Okay. Alpha over c times d, right? And so you nudge it. And uh, as time goes on, then, or plus, or whatever, I, you know, whatever, you'll have to solve it to see what it is. But you'll have a structure like this one, such that um, at, um, as time increases, this term here um, goes down, because alpha is positive, c is positive, this is negative. This is going to go towards zero, okay? Um, and what you'll be left with is temperature at equilibrium. If you had had uh, that alpha was negative, okay, then this term would have had a plus sign, right? The absolute, if you're to consider absolute value. And so this would literally blow up and push you in, in the other direction. 
Actually, I'm a little <clears throat> uncomfortable to write it like this. Um, let me write it uh, like this, uh, saying that the solution will be will look something like not alpha. Uh, let's say a plus a plus b e to the minus c over alpha times t. Um, okay, c over alpha. Alpha over C, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, where A and B are constants to be determined. Okay, I think this is a better way to write it. And, uh, you know, I'll leave it to you to determine the constants. But you kind of see what I mean. The nudging will give you uh, this term, but at long enough terms, if alpha is positive, this disappears. And in this case, in the black body feedback, is the mechanism that would bring you back to the original state that will give you, you know, this uh, exponentially decreasing term is this black body radiation um, that increasing temperature uh, increases the cooling, if you will, increases the emission. Are there other... Um... Okay, yeah, um, before we move on, obviously we are assuming that uh, there is no atmosphere, okay, so Having an atmosphere is slightly more complicated because uh, the atmosphere can emit and can absorb, uh, and so you have to take into account um, you have to take into account sort of the uh, the greenhouse effects. And if you take into account the presence of the atmosphere, then the uh, feedback parameter will be slightly lower, three point two uh, watts per meter square per, per kelvin. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, you see you. You know the the important thing is um, to know the nature of this of this kind of, of this kind of feedback. Okay. Okay. Uh, is there are there other types of feedbacks? Well, the answer is uh, yes, of course. And there are there are many feedbacks, and um, depending on uh, depending on the kind of feedbacks or the kind of processes that you're considering, um, there can be different feedbacks. And this is actually um, estimating these feedbacks is still kind of an open question to some extent, right? Understanding how these feedbacks behave um, is still an open question. Uh, one feedback that we can say for sure is out there and exists is the so-called water vapor feedback, okay? Now, uh, for this, we'll have to introduce this new term, right? Um, uh, VT in the heating. Um, we're not assuming any CO2 concentration. In this case, we just have an atmosphere that has some temperature and water vapor that is present with some concentration. Deconcentration, and I mentioned this earlier, deconcentration will itself depend on temperature uh, because, uh, you know, because of Clausius Clapeyron. Let's assume that the atmosphere is saturated for simplicity or it's very close to saturation, okay? Um, well, in that case, um, yeah, in that case, VT is pretty much, uh, you know, we could use this as the saturation mixing ratio, okay, of, uh, of the water vapor. And so when you compute the, um, when you compute the uh, water vapor feedback, well, the water vapor feedback, uh, it will contain this term, okay, but it would also contain... Uh, this term, we call the concentration of water vapor uh, at saturation mu, okay? So this times the mu star uh, with temperature, okay? Uh, do we know what these things are? Uh, well, this we know for sure because this is the Clausius clapeyron equation, okay? Um, and so this we know. Uh, this can be estimated. Um, climate models or, you know, some other kind of more sophisticated, more complex arguing. Uh, what is important, however, is that this now is, um, so um, just let me do a recap. Uh, we're saying that the uh, this parameter now depends on two things. The first is how the heating responds to the concentration of water vapor and how the concentration of water vapor responds to changes in temperature, 
changes in concentration of water vapor response to changes in temperature. This term here is generally positive, okay? And you can uh, also show that this term in general will be positive because increasing water vapor generally decreases the um, outgoing long wave radiation because you're making the atmosphere sort of more and more opaque to uh, infrared radiation, right? And so because Q was F up minus F down, if you decrease this, this is gonna go up. So increase this, um, this goes up, and so this is positive. So positive, positive means that when you put these two together, uh, the contribution to alpha due to this term will be negative because there's a minus sign in front. What does this mean? Well, it means that if you increase the concentration of water vapor, okay, um, so if there's a change in temperature, the change in temperature uh, increases the amount of water vapor that um, can be uh, held in the atmosphere, okay? And this um, increases the temperature, okay? Uh, let, let me say it again um, in, uh, in more correct English. If you were to increase the temperature of the atmosphere, okay, or of the climate and therefore of the atmosphere, uh, you would effectively increase the amount of water vapor that can be withheld by the atmosphere through classic Clapeyron equation, okay? But because the heating uh, depends, is, a, is monotonically increasing or is increasing with increasing water vapor concentration, you'd also in increase the heating in, of the atmosphere, and this would increase the temperature, okay? And so this is an example of a positive feedback now, okay? So you nudge the system one way and the system just keeps going the other way. Um, if you will, another way to think about these feedbacks, um, think about different, uh, you know, having a bowl and uh, you have a, a ball at the bottom of the bowl and you can place it like this inside of the bowl or you can place it like this outside of the bowl. And in this case, if you push the ball one way, then the shape of the ball will of the bowl will make it go back to where it was before. This is an example of a negative feedback. Positive feedback is the other case where you push the um, the, the ball a little bit and it will just keep going. Okay, and this is kind of what it is. Um, and um, in case you weren't already, uh, this should be very alarming to you because. Um, because positive feedbacks make systems explode, essentially, right? Um, you know, the more you're going, the more you're heating up, the more you heat up, the more the system heats up. Um, and this would make, you know, the earth kind of blow up. Um, there are uh, theories, or there's a hypothesis that, uh, that Venus was once like, um, that Venus was once like uh, was once like the Earth, uh, you know, very very similar planet to uh, to Earth, but uh, for whatever reason, it went into what is known as the runaway greenhouse effect, where you know uh, some positive feedback kicked in, and oceans started to boil, and uh, they kind of evaporated, and now Venus is completely uninhabitable. Um, something like this could happen on Earth uh, if there was no other negative feedbacks to keep, to keep things in place. Um, but luckily, well, luckily so far it hasn't happened. Um, and it kind of, in this case, uh, we've already outlined two different feedbacks that um, act um, simultaneously. And so which one kind of wins? Which one wins? Sort of depends on how big the two are you know, the relative magnitude. And it looks like an absolute value, the um, water vapor feedback is less than half the black body feedback, meaning that the tendency to push the system out of equilibrium is much less than the tendency to push it back to equilibrium. And so this is one way that we could understand how the Earth has been stable so far uh, throughout all this time. If 
uh, this number, instead of being 0.4, had been bigger than 1, uh, then yes, we would have been in runaway greenhouse effect. Uh, I believe, um, although don't quote me on this, but I believe that in order, some simple, you can show through simplified calculations that in order for the Earth to enter a runaway greenhouse effect scenario, temperatures would have to increase by uh, about 10 degrees, which is a lot. Um, not impossible uh, if, we, you know, if we keep going uh, down this way, but um, you know, so far, unlikely. Um, obviously, um, these are climate feedbacks, so, no, so kind of internal feedbacks. But um, there's also other things like forcing terms and specifically uh, forcings like the forcing due to increase in CO2 concentrations. Um, and this has been shown, has been shown to um, be proportional to the logarithm of, um, of the increase. So if we were to increase CO2 by a factor beta, by a factor two, then the uh, changes would be proportional to the logarithm of two. Okay, so not linear dependence, but kind of logarithmic dependence. And um, I mean, we don't. Um, uh, this, by reference, is CO2 concentration in the last 400,000 years. Notice that it barely got above 300 ppm, and we're now, this is actually old, um, we're now here in uh, this uh, orange dot, it is, uh, just to give you some reference. Um, I mean, I don't want to uh, go too deep into this, but um, okay, well, so suppose that um, the, uh, the ground is a black body that is emitting with some temperature, right? Um, then we can always write the spectral radiance like I, don't, I taught you at the beginning with Planck function, okay? Um, and this would be a function of the temperature of the ground, so that's okay. Uh, we will assume that the um, troposphere is, there's a troposphere overlaying the ground. Let's say the troposphere is just, you know, one big chunk of stuff that has some kind of temperature and uh, some kind of um, Planck's function itself, and also uh, some spectral transmittance, okay? Uh, in this case, we can compute the uh, upward spectral radiance uh, at the top of the atmosphere. And this would be, uh, if you will, it would be a combination of two things. The first is uh, whatever is emitted at the ground, uh, excuse me, from the ground, and is transmitted upward, and then whatever is transmitted by um, the troposphere itself. Okay. So, and this would be kind of a similar thing to the outgoing long wave radiation, except that we're still considering the, um, we're still differentiating across different wavelengths. Uh, so this is the spectral outgoing long wave radiation, okay, or SOLR. Um, if you had a completely opaque atmosphere, then T nu would be exactly zero, okay, because nothing would be transmitted. And so uh, whatever is emitted at the top of the atmosphere is simply given by pi times uh, Planck's function relative to the temperature of the atmosphere. If you had an atmosphere that was completely tra transparent, then in that case, the transmittance would be one and the atmosphere wouldn't really do anything and wouldn't really emit much. And so this term would go to zero and you'd only have pi b nu um, with a temperature of the ground. So this kind of makes sense. Everything else is, you could think of this as a weighted average between these two um, spectral emissions. Now remember that if you, uh, the transmittance could be related to the, uh, well, the density of the gas and the uh, extinction coefficient, okay? And remember this was just, uh, you know, coming from the diffuse approximation. So this is just, definition of straight straight out definition of transmittance and so the important thing for us is here right this is this density here is essentially related to the concentration of co2 okay so we are changing this and changes in this would translate to changes in this okay which then would mean changes in the forcing okay
So if we're assuming that, um, you know, that uh, we are multiplying the, the concentration by a factor beta, okay, so rho goes in, goes to beta rho, uh, because uh, transmittance T was exponential of minus 1.66 K rho, okay, if you multiply this by beta, you can also factor this out, and this would be uh, t to the beta, okay? This is just simple uh, property of exponentials. Um, and let's assume that um, the, um, let's assume that temperature of the ground in the troposphere kind of remained, um, remained fixed, okay? So uh, this means that changes in the forcing, because the Planck func Planck's functions remain the same, Changes in forcings are going to be related to changes in transmittance, which mean uh, the difference between the transmittance at the beta power minus the transmittance uh, that was before. Okay, uh, and this you can call this the the d function, and it's nicely shown here. Okay, so <clears throat> for different values of the transmittance, okay, uh, how does um, how does d change? Okay. And this is just, you know, uh, x time x beta to the minus one, minus one. I mean, it's just uh, with a, obviously with a minus in front, okay? The, so these are just, um, you know, simple uh, parabola with a, with a small, uh, with a linear term. Um, okay, so you can compute then that the, um, this maximum here, okay? This point here, which is the maximum of the parameters, this depends on the logarithm of beta, okay? And this is essentially how, um, you know, uh, how the logarithm of beta comes out, you know, when we said f was proportional to the logarithm of beta. The reason is that uh, if you look at, you know, what is the biggest effect, so where is the maximum uh, d, this depends on the logarithm of beta, okay? And this is because... Uh, D was simply, you know, the change between a power, you know, T to the power of beta minus, minus D. So, it, you know, this is just to give you a sense of how uh, the logarithm of, of beta came about, which is kind of a strange, um, kind of a strange thing to, um, you know, it's always strange with logarithms. I, I don't know about you, but I'm always kind of, I don't know, a bit weirded out by logarithms. Anyway, um, okay, so, um, how do uh, how does you know how does these these changes uh, look like? Well, this is the transmittance uh, for um, as a function of frequency or wavelength, and this is in correspondence to um, the fifteen micrometer absorption line of uh, CO two. Okay. Um, now this uh, the transmittance is one, and then when the band starts. Uh, here you have all these different modes that kind of absorb, but you know essentially at some point um, there's some width, but the the window sort of closes and transmittance goes to zero. You know if you were to like um, average over all these things so as to get rid of all these wiggles and and changes, it would look something like this. Okay. Now it's clear that um, d, the function d, we had defined as uh, d was t to the beta minus t, meaning uh, the change in transmittance. Okay, that happens, and it's clear that if we make this absorption line, uh, you know, if we make it bigger, if we make it broader or smaller, weaker or stronger, it's clear that. Uh, D is going to be maximum on these regions here, sort of on the flanks, right, of these functions. Uh, why is that? Well, because these values here, these are already at zero, right? So if you make this broader, if you make this smaller, these will not change. It will just stay zero. Below 20 and above, and, uh, sorry, above 20 and below 12, these values also don't change, you know, they also, they always stay at one. So changes will likely impact 
this region here. Okay, and this is where D is kind of relevant. It's kind of relevant for us. Um, okay, so you can compute that um, if you look at changes in uh, the spectral outgoing long wave radiation, then this is what they look like. This shows the difference between uh, the new peaks, the, the new sort of transmittance and the old transmittance. And they're kind of, you can see that they correspond to the areas where before you had, sort of you had those two, um, those two uh, flanks. And this is for doubling of CO2, this is for quadrupling of CO2. Uh, and notice how similar they look like to each other. And that's kind of uh, lucky. Uh, and it's a lucky consequence of the um, of the um, logarithmic scaling, you know, F going scaling like the logarithm of beta, which I'm going to write once again because it's really important. Um, Okay, yeah, this is another way uh, to look at it, uh, not normalizing, not looking at transmittance, but just looking at <clears throat> the outgoing long wave radiation. And again, this is the, uh, the um, um, yeah, the um, long wave radiation at the ground, long wave at the tropopause, and this is the absorption that happens because of, of CO2, and this is uh, you know, the change that will happen, you know, the dash line is um, the changes uh, due to doubling of CO2. Um, last thing I wanted to say, yeah, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so the last thing I wanted to say um, about the forcing due to CO2 uh, is that um, CO2, changes in CO2 are kind of uh, lucky because um, for other things like uh, chlorofluorocarbon uh, gases, you know, the famous uh, CFCs uh, that cause the, uh, the disappearance of, um, of the ozone hole, the appearance of the ozone hole, um, these um, scale, they don't scale as the logarithm of beta, you know, if you increase um, these gases by a factor of beta, the forcing will not be, will not increase by uh, the logarithm of beta, but they'll increase uh, linearly with beta. And so they will have uh, a much stronger effect on the atmosphere than, or on the climate as a whole, than, um, than CO2. So I just want to say you know, we're kind of, I don't know, I didn't want to say that we're lucky, but it could be worse. It could be worse. Okay, uh, finally, let's talk about clouds and let's see what uh, effects cloud can ha clouds can have. Uh, first of all, why should we talk about clouds or the forcing due to clouds? Well, clouds cover about 50% of the sky on a global scale. Okay, so they're pretty much important in the atmosphere. And the impact of clouds uh, on the temperature or the kind of interaction that clouds can have can be divided in two different categories. Uh, there can be uh, radiative effects, okay, um, or there can also be a simple albedo effect, okay. Uh, albedo effect is pretty simple to understand and it's just clouds are either transparent or reflect back incoming radiation. Radiative effects uh, is a little bit trickier to consider, are a little bit trickier to consider, and we'll have to think about those a little bit more carefully. Uh, okay, so let's do that. Um, clouds can be divided in different categories or in different ways, can be categorized in different ways. And according to the way in which you categorize clouds, then these can have different effects, okay? Uh, or it can represent different effects. So for example, you could think about thin versus thick clouds, you know, think about cirrus cloud versus a cumulonimbus cloud that is represented here. There, there are high versus low albedo clouds or cold versus warm clouds. Um, so um, 
how do these different types affect the radiated balance? Um, okay, so here I'm just showing you the schematic, um, the different types of clouds. You have thin ones, you have thick ones, very cold ones, very warm ones, uh, high albedo, uh, low albedo, and whatnot. Um, okay, so first of all, a cloud that has a lot of... Um, Right, so a cloud that has a lot of liquid water leads to an increase in greenhouse effect, okay? Um, because uh, liquid water is a good absorber of in, in the atmospheric window, okay? Which is where the Earth's surface most efficiently radiates to space. However, a cold cloud also radiates to space, um, right? But it radiates less efficiently than if there were no cloud. However, cold top clouds also reflect more sunlight and those increase and thus increase albedo. And these two effects tend to cancel each other. Okay, so you immediately have you know a couple of things going on here. Um, right? Uh, liquid water tends to warm um, the atmosphere, but then at the same time the clouds, if if it's uh, you know a cold cloud, then it tends to radiate a lot uh, to space. Uh, and so how these effects balance is exactly uh, what will give you the final answer as to how clouds, um, how the radiative, the radiative effects from clouds will influence uh, what is going on, okay? Um, in general, we know that uh, low clouds that are warm-topped and uh, they are high albedo, they tend to decrease the heat flux and um, they tend to have less liquid water uh, available for a greenhouse effect. Sum all these things together, these clouds, so clouds like cumulus clouds, tend to cool down the planet. A uh, thin, warm top, high albedo cloud, stratocumulus clouds, for example, will similarly, um, you know, tend to cool down the planet. But if you have a thin, cold top, uh, low albedo cloud. This will be transparent to incoming radiation, but it will have an effect on the outgoing long wave radiation, and these tend to warm the planet instead. Uh, as we said before, thicker clouds like cumulonimbus clouds, um, these have a lot of liquid water, and so they warm the planet, but they have higher albedo, so they could cool it down, and so the jury is still out for these kinds of clouds, and it's still not unclear what these will do. Uh, I will go briefly on these uh, just because these, I mean, this is just some uh, procedural things that are not particularly relevant uh, or, you know, they're not really the core or the key message here. But essentially, one way that cloud radiative forcing is measured is by estimating the forcing, uh, the net fluxes in cloudy columns of air uh, or in cloudy conditions versus the net fluxes in clear sky conditions, okay? Uh, and this is how these uh, are measured. Obviously, uh, you can also distinguish in short wave forcing and long wave forcing, okay? And uh, you break these down uh, according to uh, the um, uh, wavelengths that you're considering. Um, uh, and um, and obviously, whenever you have positive forcing, it means that clouds tend to increase the net energy that is pumped into the Earth's climate system. Negative forcing means that they have the opposite effect. Okay. And the cloud radiated forcing is a measure of how much the clouds are affecting the climate. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so. I, I think there's still much that we don't understand about this. In general, it appears that clouds tend to have a net cooling effect, and this net cooling effect is pretty high, uh, between 13 and minus 13 and minus 21 watts per meter square, uh, which you know should be compared with the doubling of CO2, which is of the order of four watts per meter square. Um, these numbers are obviously variable. It depends on the area of the globe where you are. It depends on the season where you are. Um, but in general, yeah, clouds tend to seem to have a cooling effect. I'll just leave it up there that this is still 
a matter of some somewhat still a matter of debate and you know it's still something that we're struggling to measure um, observationally and also something that we struggle to understand <clears throat> using numerical models. Okay, well, this concludes uh, what I had to say about uh, radiative feedbacks today, and it also concludes the radiation part and the class of Atmos 620, which I hope you enjoyed as much as I enjoyed um, putting it together and uh, delivering it for you, for you guys. I am really sorry that unfortunately this semester we had to do everything online. Um, it was, uh, unfortunately, given the circumstances, the only safe way to do this class. Um, but nevertheless, I hope it wasn't too bad for you guys and uh, that I managed to teach you something uh, in, in all these lectures. As usual, for any questions, drop me an email, uh, Skype message, write to me on Slack, whatever. Um, otherwise, well, I guess I will uh, see you for the final exam. Thank you very much for listening.